Yeah. Insulin's job, I always think of it as like a little suction cup that kind of like pops out of the cell, right? And if you think of glucose as kind of these like balls sort of floating around, insulin will like, it'll catch onto an insulin suction cup and just pull it into the cell. It's very scientific. So um, yeah, if you think about it that way, then when you're training, your body doesn't want to be sucking up carb and putting it into the cell. It wants to be using it and burning it. So you are correct in saying that what you're taking in during your training is being basically, it's like, it's think about driving a car, another analogy, right? You're, you put the gas in and you're burning it. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. We are back with our special guest, Laura Moretti Reese. Welcome back, Laura. Thank you. I was so excited to get your email. I always love coming on your podcast. So <laughs> I am Thank so you. happy you're here. Again, this is a three peat, and Ooh. you may or may not know that your last episode which was obviously still about fueling for performance was one of our most listened to episodes. So Aww, I, it's like, so I know happy. you just made my day. It makes me happy too. Um, so a quick <laughs> intro for anybody who has not listened to those previous two podcasts, but you should go back um, and listen to those. Laura is a board certified sports dietitian specializing in sports performance based nutrition, as well as treating low energy availability, disordered eating and eating disorders in athletes. She works at the division of sports medicine and the female athlete program at Boston children's hospital hospital. Sorry. She also runs her own private practice, nutrition counseling outside of Boston children's hospital. Um, so that was our, intro, but we're going to get right into it. Last time you were on this podcast, I think at the very end, I was like, we should do a myth buster mm -hmm. thing for all, for, you know, eating and sports eating and all of that. And I posted that you were coming back on the podcast to our team and I got some great questions. So we'll just say this whole podcast is myth busting because that's kind of what you do. You set it us is. straight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the first question that we have for you is we're going to talk about macros and mm. you know, yeah, I know. And I want to <laughs> get your hot take on macros. I think macros is such a buzzword. So I'm going to ask the question. Somebody asked what macros are best for endurance athletes in general? And before, I mean, before we even go into that answer, can you just explain what macros are? Because yes. I feel like it yes. gets lost. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that. Actually. I love, I love the, the clarification request because I do feel like the, it is such a buzzword. And then I always, like when I give a lecture, I always start off with, I call it, like I say, we're going to go to nutrition school and I'm going to give you a, you know, we're going to do, we're going to set the, set the groundwork. So yes. So what is a macro? So macro is short for um, macronutrient. So those are the nutrients we need in the largest quantities in our diets. So proteins, carbs, and fats, right? So that's, that is what a, when you hear macro, um, that's what we're referring to. If you hear micro, that's when we're getting into vitamins and minerals, right? Not the, not the major okay food groups, right? So then you're talking about iron, you're talking about calcium. Those are all going to go in that micro. No one talks about micros, really. <laughs> we should, we, maybe we should talk about micros after macros. <laughs> next episode, my hashtag micros. I don't know. Um, macros, cool. Yeah. What was the question? Carbs. Wait, what? No, did I say that already? Well, yeah, I yeah. know. The question was like, what is a good percentage of macros for endurance athletes? And even though we veer toward female endurance athletes, we do have a lot of male listeners. So if there ever is during this conversation, a difference between maybe what a, a man should eat and a female happy to I'd love for you to bring it up. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most of it, um, in most of what is out there as far as reputable research. Yeah. There's not, going to be significant difference, especially when we're talking about macros, because it is mostly based on 
why I would say we talk in metrics. So it's kilos really. So when I'm going to give some, um, some ideas about ranges, percentages, ranges of macronutrients, but the way, like when I'm factoring someone's energy needs, I'm thinking all about macros, right? Because that is Mm -hmm. the, the way that I create a plan for an athlete is by understanding what is their training volume, mm-hmm. right? Um, number one, I mean, understanding a lot of things. I'm not trying to simplify what I do here, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're looking at training volume. We're looking at um, a lot of, you know, goals, um, current diet. There's there's a lot of things, but for every sport out or every sport, I'll say every sport, probably most of them, there are these sort of evidence-based ranges of macronutrients, right? So basically, depending on someone's volume, the ranges that you need of your macronutrients are going to shift. So I will explain that a little bit more. So basically I joke about carbohydrates, all that, what we know, I I should have worn my, I have a, um, I have an eat carb shirt and it's phenomenal. Um, It was a major fail on my part, not wearing that. Even though people can't see it, they would, I should just tell them (laughs) So basically, when you think about what someone's needs are going to look like, right, as someone's aerobic volume is building, right, as we're building that aerobic base, that aerobic volume, we're doing more and more and more, the macronutrient that changes the most is actually the carbohydrates, right? So to get sciencey on us here, they basically, you know, when we're thinking about, well, how many grams of carbohydrates do I need, right, macros, Um, Mm -hmm. it can be anywhere from will go real crazy here, you know, one to three grams per kilo of body weight of carbohydrate, which is pretty darn low, right? That's Mm -hmm. not going to be someone that's doing a lot of aerobic volume. That might be someone that's barely exercising, um, that, you know, low, low volume. When we're getting into someone who's on, you know, doing full Ironman training or, or higher volume marathon, um, training, doing maybe 20 hours a week or kind of upwards in that range, we really start to get into that like seven, eight, no, I should say actually eight, nine, 10. I mean, people that are doing like ultra endurance might be in that 10 to 12 range of grams of carbohydrate per kilo of body weight. So if someone weighs, you know, 130 pounds or 59 kilos, right? You're taking that number and we're saying, okay, you need seven grams of carbohydrate per, you know, kilo of body weight. So that's, you customize someone's plan based on their size too, right? So you're not Mm -hmm. like, versus when we talk about like grams of carb per hour, when you're racing, that's not based on how much someone weighs. Those are more general ranges, right? 30 Mm -hmm. to 90 grams of carb per hour. We're not, you know, we will take someone's you know, size, metabolism, fitness level into account when we're creating those plans. But Mm -hmm. to bring it back, I realize I've gone down a rabbit hole, which often happens. No, we like rabbit holes. (laughs) Yeah. Like I could just, I could do an entire hour on carbohydrates, but um, (laughs) maybe so. I mean, for endurance athletes, right. That's really the name of the game though. So when you think about it though, protein, I feel like everyone loves to talk about protein and yes, it is super, super important, right? Each macronutrient, they're macro, right? Because we need them in the greatest percentages in the diet, right? But a lot of times the protein people come into me and I'll go through their diets. And a lot of times their protein grams might be all the way up to kind of maxed out. That's sort of like two to 2.2 grams of protein per kilo, which is around a gram per pound of body weight, right? A lot of people come to me with that question because apparently it's a, speaking of myths, um, there's a, apparently a TikTok trend uh, that says eat like a gram of protein per, um, you know, per pound of body weight. So, Well, that's not completely wrong. When you're working with someone who has very high carbohydrate needs, if you're trying to eat, you know, 150 grams of protein a day, you are not going to have room for all the carbohydrates that you need, right? So you start to then, I mean, someone might overeat at that point then, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So we actually have to scale back like the amount of protein And again, we're talking evidence-based ranges here, right? Um, A a favorite fact I like to share is that, here I go into the metric system again, 
mm-hmm. if an individual is a just a, your average person on the street who's not working out, who's not training, their grams of protein, it's like 0.8 grams per kilo, where an athlete is automatically, we're starting at like 1.2 grams per kilo. Um, so this is like more numbers than I ever, it's kind of funny. Like I'm so number, I feel like I'm very numbers focused on this question. Um, <laughs> what I often, I'm going to caveat Amy and say that a lot of times what I say to my athletes, I mean, I definitely let, let's be honest, triathletes love numbers. Um, but a lot <laughs> of times I will say to my, my athletes when I'm making them a meal plan, like, let me worry about the numbers. I'm going to translate that to food for you, right? Like this means two cups of rice and four ounces of chicken, right? Like okay. um, I will give people a lot of like grams sometimes, obviously during like racing, I give people we're working on hitting those ranges that we're looking for. But again, I digress, Bring, coming back mm-hmm. out of my rabbit hole. So basically with the macros, what you're doing is – we're constantly sort of shifting them, right? As aerobic volume is increasing, we're dialing up the amount of carbohydrate in the diet. We might be dialing down the protein a little bit and the fat fat stays relatively constant. Um, I will talk in percentages for a moment yeah. as well. Um, so basically what we're looking at is you, I haven't talked about fats yet, so I'm gonna start there with percentages. So the fat percentage of the diet you never want to go less than 20% of total calories from fat is okay. territory for reds, right? That's where mm. we can start to see that hormonal suppression. So you want to make sure I err on the side of caution and I may have misspoke. It's either 20 or 25. Um, I have to look back at my citation, but I typically tend to, I don't typically put anyone on less than 25% of total calories from fat because I want to make sure that, again, we have enough fat in the body to support hormonal functioning, right? Which is, as we've talked about in the past, which is going to um, help protect um, bone health. Um, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's in there, prevent stress fractures. Uh, so fat should never go below that, okay? And when okay. I'm factoring energy needs, fat is typically, we t- a lot of times we figure out the c- protein and the carbs, and then we sort of put fat, figure out the fat after that, Um Mm-hmm. Carbo, I mean, the protein grams can be anywhere. A lot of times they're actually as low as 15% of total calories, which surprises mm. a lot of people. People think, oh, it should be at least 30 or 35%. But a lot of times if you have the fat at 25, protein at like 15 to 20%, because wait for it, carbohydrates, again, as you're increasing your volume, you might get up at certain points of your training to be... 60, 65, even 70% of your total calories from carbohydrate. Higher volume. Right. We're talking about a 5K or a sprint here, right? Okay. Um, so my question is, if we're talking about, let's say somebody, and we have talked about tracking in my fitness pal or other things before, there are pros and cons to that depending on your relationship with food. So if somebody is using my fitness pal, maybe it's just a check-in. They're like, am I eating enough carbs, yeah. fat, and protein? Yeah. Yeah. Um, nope. And Sometimes my athletes will do that. Um, yes. If they are like a sprint or Olympic athlete, so they're they're not super, they're not doing twenty hours. They might be right. doing ten right. hours a week. Yeah. That's aerobic strength. Uh, yep. It's what would you say it, they should percentage. be aiming for for their percentages? And I know you can give a yeah. range. Right. Absolutely. And and this is a good point you make because there are definitely athletes. Again, if someone has a very like healthy relationship with food, numbers don't bother them, they help them. Um, I have athletes too that that definitely in some circumstances, they want to check in on it. Am I hitting my numbers? Am I there? So I would say about like 50%, you'd still be looking at that about 50% of um, your total calories coming from carbohydrate. I still wouldn't go much below that. Um, but again, and you could dial So that would mean, more. yeah, that would mean 25% protein. Now, because yep. if, if you're talking about 25% fat, now, I'm going to segue into something that, um, and I'm going to come back to a bigger question I have, is the social media role of protein right now, especially when, and, I, I, and at first I was thinking, oh, it's just perimenopausal and menopausal women need more protein, build muscle, yeah. get yeah. leaner. But now I'm seeing a trend shifting toward women in their twenties yeah. and all they call them the Pilates girlies, you know, but, um, 
yeah. get, you know, getting, I know that's a new, it's all over my TikTok. Um, I don't even know but, that. I'm uh, looking on TikTok, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a new trend that supposedly like just doing Pilates is going to get you lean and ripped. Um, but then we have some people saying the reason why this is happening is because these girls are um, not eating enough. But anyway, my point being about protein is what we are hearing as older women is you need more protein and you up your protein up your protein because right. that's how you lose yeah. the fat that fat that has either the visceral fat or whatever yeah. um yeah. so what is your philosophy with this protein does that change depending on who you're dealing with it i mean again it depends on i i i definitely have individuals on higher protein diets. I mean, it, it's all about the balance. So like, I can't say that enough times. Like I definitely, okay. two grams per kilo or that one gram per pound of body weight. Um, a lot of times if someone is, let's say they're not doing that higher aerobic volume, they don't like, we're talking about Pilates. I'm just going to use your example. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> You're not, there's not a lot of aerobic demand and Pilates is an amazing, I mean, it's so great. Yes. Body, but, um, you know, I'm all about a blend with, with kind of everything, so, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if someone's not doing a ton of aerobic activity, you can play around with like going higher on your protein. I mean, I'm still not going to neglect someone's protein needs, but the fact of the matter is like, it's just like, you are going to be taking in too much food. If you're trying to be on the super high protein diet, be an endurance athlete. Like you're just in order to hit those carbohydrate ranges, you're, you're going to overeat, which that's not helpful either. Right. So it right. is the thing to remember too, is the body is only going to absorb all the research is shows they're, they're always playing around with this, but currently the body doesn't absorb more than about 2.2 grams per kilo of, of protein. That's like more, a little bit more, right. Than one gram per pound. Right. So your body, mm -hmm. if someone's trying to go way above that, if you are a 120 pound female and you're trying to eat 200 grams of protein a day, it's all not actually usable. The body okay. can't, can't use all that. Right. So you're, and Typically, like a lot of times that's, that can be, um, it's, cr it's typically crowding out other nutrients, right? So mm -hmm. the balance overall is going to be off. Um, mm. but if I have someone who comes in and maybe they're again, they're doing some aerobic volume, but really they're doing, they're more focused on their strength training. Um, I'll go higher. I'll go more minimal on the, on the carbohydrate. The carbohydrate might be more like, <clears throat> sometimes it is closer to like 40% of the diet or sometimes even a little bit lower if someone, and depending on the age, right? If someone is a little bit older, they're not doing a lot of aerobic volume. We can go lower on the carbohydrate, right? I'm, I'm not like anti doing that. I don't, don't want people to think I'm just like, no, just like load up on carbs all the time. If you're <laughs> yeah. them, you don't, need high volumes of them. Right. Um, so it is really all about, <clears throat> I always feel like I have these like moving pieces, like plate models, right. Where I'm constantly mm -hmm. shifting, you know, if people could see how much I was talking with my hands right now. Um, your hands, yeah. This exact, I literally 10 minutes before our call, I like was eating my delicious sweet green salad. I just created an amazing new combo and I was talking <laughs> zoom and I smashed it and sweet green like exploded all over my office. <laughs> it was so sad because it was like, the, I'm very excited about my new combo, but <clears throat> we okay. don't have sweet green out here in Cape Cod. Sad. Uh, <laughs> I need to go into Boston for that. I do I'm love a good sweet there, green. Uh, a lot of the time. So I, I am aware, <laughs> but you've got a lot of other very delicious, yummy. Uh, I had my lobster roll on uh, yesterday for lunch. So, um, <clears throat> delicious. So again, it's all about that balance, right? But mm -hmm. yeah, I always feel like I'm constantly, even when I'm working with athletes, different seasons, different times of the year, like let's say you have mm. you know, your two athletes that are off season, right? Or they're doing a lower aerobic volume or more like zone two stuff. I'm going to bump up. So that actually answers that question too, <clears throat> especially for our peri and postmenopausal females as well. But any athlete really, I'm going to bump up that protein when we're in sort of that like quote off season, right? When you're focused more on strength building, we're going to drop those carbohydrates back down and we're going to bump up the, the protein. So you're then, maybe you are closer to that, you know, pound, uh, excuse me, that, you know, gram per pound of body weight, right? I'm not going to have you do that when you're doing your higher volume aerobic training. It's just, it's going to crowd out space for carbohydrate. 
Okay. That makes sense. Does that make sense? So you, yeah. Um, I want to touch on something you within this conversation mentioned the word hormones and how it can disrupt certain, um, you know, if you don't have enough of one macro, it can disrupt hormones. I do have a question and it's been, I feel like I've been seeing it a lot about cortisol Mm -hmm. here. Um, and Mm -hmm. this person asks, does cortisol from training hard add up over time and make you gain weight? Um, And I'm going to kind of expand that for you into cortisol in general. Um, And what, if you could explain what cortisol is and how our cortisol goes up. And this woman says that she just read that cortisol from training can add up and make you gain weight. And she read that in a weight training group and they're slightly biased against cardio. But um, but can you talk about the effect of cortisol? I've been here, especially for perimenopausal and menopausal women, but in general. Yeah. And I will say this is more like, this is a little more feels like more of a Dr. Ackerman question. Um, oh, gotcha. Dr. Ackerman, we'll we've interviewed get, her. Yeah. <laughs> she, we'll, we'll get her, we'll get her back on my work wife. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I will speak within my knowledge and then yeah. I, will, mm-hmm. I don't want to overstep my area of expertise here. Um, Cause there, it is normal. I mean, you're going to have an increase in cortisol from training. There's a very normal, um, that's a normal response to, to intense training. I don't, I have not heard, you know, I'm going to go into that question. I'm going to come back out again and mm-hmm. speak a little more generally. Uh, that to me sounds a little myth-tastic um, mm-hmm. that cortisol from intense training can lead to weight gain. I have never heard that. I've never seen that. Um, in the literature and the why, you know, I don't have a good answer on that. Now I'm going to have to go Mm -hmm. do my work, but, um, because cortisol, this is where I'm going to flip to that zoning out answer. Yes. Elevated cortisol has shown to, to increase out of, um, like adipose tissue, Mm -hmm. central abdominal region. Um, and it would have to do with the, you know, a lot of times it has to do with sort of like the body's fight or flight response, right? So when the body's Mm. in a stressed out period, it's sort of getting into that protective, that protective space. We have to store energy more as fat, right? The body is in, you know, it goes back to caveman brain, right? We're, there's a threat here. Um, We got to protect this house. We got to protect the body so the body can increase. Um, You can get an increase in, in body fat as a result of sort of that like protective quote mechanism. Um, so it does go down to kind of like, it all boils down to the, back to that fight or flight mechanism. Um, and the, the other thing with cortisol levels, cortisol, and I think for our, for our, for our females out there to to hear is that cortisol can suppress estrogen. Um, so I, stress levels, like, you know, that we are always asking our, our, uh, female patients about, um, their, you know, menstrual cycles, right? That's, that's a common conversation in our offices to understand their energy balance. So sometimes it might, it's not always like their intake. It can be someone has very high levels of stress in their life. And that has an estrogen suppressing effect. And I'm pretty sure we can ask my my good friend, um, the endocrinologist, Dr. Ackerman. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you think of it again, sort of in that that state of if the body's in a high stress environment, the body thinks about hormones mainly around child childbearing, right? So mm-hmm. if the body is under a lot of stress, the body should not be you know getting pregnant, right? That's so. I always think of things like that's the same. It's one of the reasons like the body is under stress. You stop getting your period, right? So it's in that's It could be stress from, you know, under fueling. It could be stress from, from high training levels. So <clears throat> there is this sort of relationship then if your body's experiencing so much stress that there is that suppression of the estrogen. So sometimes we work with our patients too on just de-stressing, decreasing. Um, dec- I mean, we all have stress in our lives. It's impossible to eliminate it, but yeah really high levels. I've, I've worked with a, a lot of people that that has been one of the, the limiting factors in getting their cycle back. Maybe we've reestablished the, the dietary patterns, but we're, we're in a, uh, we're in a high stress environment and that can still cause suppression of estrogen. So, so is yeah. that when we talk about, cause we had another question about under fueling, which we've talked yeah. about a lot. Yep. So if you are an endurance athlete and you are under fueling, is that 
and causing you to hold on to weight or spiking your cortisol. Um, because we work out, cortisol goes up. Cortisol is a, a good yes. hormone. Sure. Like you need cortisol. Yeah, I mean, it has, um, there's positive effects of it too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So you work out, the cortisol yeah. goes up. Yep. And the recovery brings the cortisol down, but does food help bring the cortisol down? Is that a piece of under fueling and gaining weight? We had a question about the, the general yeah. question is why does under fueling make you gain weight? Like it doesn't, yeah. and we've talked about this before, but it comes up constantly. Cause I always say in your brain, it doesn't compute because I'm eating less calories. Right. And for right. some people that works like that's, right. That's how you lose weight. <laughs> Why, if I'm eating less calories, am I not losing weight like my friend next to me? Right. That was and a random question. Right. And we've talked about that one. Yeah, exactly. That like, and also if someone has always lost weight from under fueling, there's usually a point where then they can't lose weight anymore and they start to gain weight. Um, that's right. So like the metabolism kind of gets you know, messed up for lack of a better clinical term there. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm not sure to say that like food decreases cortisol, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't, there's, I'm not a hundred percent sure of like how to answer like that correlation mm -hmm. but there is, you know, if the body's being nourished, you're, you're decreasing that there is a decrease in stress on the body from getting adequate nourishment. So again, I don't want to get in the weeds too much because I'm, yeah. I'm like, I feel like I'm starting to step out of my, out of my zone. <laughs> there. Um, I'm trying to stay in my lane, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, under fueling. I will say this. I think this is just a helpful general statement too that under fueling is increases stress on the body. It's an inflammatory state. So which is going to further increase cortisol levels. So if someone is fueling, they're fueling adequately. It should, I mean, if you're doing like, if an A then equals B, then B equals C, then A equals C, right? Um, so is there, you know, if the body's getting an adequate amount of nutrition, there should be an effect on, again, I, I don't want to misspeak here. Um, I feel like there's going to mm -hmm. be someone who's like an exercise physician or an endocrinologist. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> So I am, I am owning that. I'm not a hundred percent sure and that I'm maybe not explaining this perfectly. Um, we will have to tap Dr. Ackerman to come back on. It sounds like for some more deep dive into hormones. Um, <clears throat> don't worry. I'll get her. I'll get her. I'll get her back on for you. Yeah. Get her on. She may have to come back after the Olympics though. She's a little busy after the end for the next, uh, <laughs> you know, to August. That's okay. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit because we had a couple questions about sugar yeah. um, and sugar in the, in the realm of endurance athletes, because yeah. we pound a lot of gummies and goo yeah. Yeah. and, and, you know, you're burning through it because you need that glucose and fructose, but yeah. how does sugar play a role for your endurance athletes? Like if we're going on a three hour bike ride and we're ingesting 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour, which is like the general thing. And that's right. mainly in sugar form. Correct. Um, how does our body metabolize that? Should we eat less sugar outside of training because we just pounded yeah. all that sugar. And especially <laughs> this question came from a woman in perimenopause where yeah. like, it's all the buzzwords are like eat clean. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, so talk to us about sugar with endurance athletes and how we try to balance that. Yeah. So the, the, during you, you nailed it, right? Like what you're doing with your diet outside of training. I mean, <clears throat> bottom line is like, I typically encourage my athletes again, within reason to eat. Yeah. I mean, to eat a well-balanced nourished diet, right? Cause you need carbohydrates in the diet, but yeah, I mean, getting those carbohydrates to increase your glycogen storage, right? So carbohydrate is stored in the liver and in the muscle um, as glycogen. So when you're getting carbohydrates in your diet, your body is storing that to be used, and I'll explain that in a second, but to be used during your next training session, right? And throughout the day, your body does use carbohydrate um, for energy. So I typically will encourage someone, you know, to eat foods that are like high quality, um, just like it would with anybody, like less simple sugars throughout the day. Again, if you're going to have, I'm the last person to tell you not to have like a cookie here and there, things like that. Right. But I'm going to circle over to training for a bit and then come back to this. But when you're mm -hmm. training, <clears throat> yes, I mean, the simple sugar, those highly branched multiple forms of carbohydrate, you want to 
utilize all those intestinal absorption uh, transporters, you know, so you want multiple types of carbohydrate. And when you're training, your insulin response um, is, is suppressed. So the body knows it needs energy in the form of carbohydrate. So whatever you've stored leading up to your workout is typically going to burn out in the first, I mean, it's, slightly debatable, but about 45 minutes or so. So bringing in those exogenous carbohydrates, because again, if you don't have adequate, you know, if you don't have that exogenous carbohydrate coming in, then your body does use it. It can create glucose, um, out of protein, right? So not an optimal fact. We just talked about all the roles that protein has. We don't want to break down muscle to, to burn energy, right? Which is also why when you see someone who's maybe, <clears throat> very underweight. You see a lot of muscle wasting too, because they're breaking down mm. muscle for energy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to burn fat alongside carbohydrate. We always say fat burns in a flame of carbohydrate. So, um, fat is being burned. Fat is being also, but if you're like, you're out there, you're out there for a long time, you're the, the fat, you're going to need the carbohydrate to also help more optimally use the fat as, as an energy source too. So we're not taking in fat on a, during our training. I mean, sometimes on a bike, you can, like if you're, because you're not jostling your stomach as more, but typically fat is, is going to cause more GI distress, right? You want a quick energy source and carb is the quickest. So your insulin response to circle back gets suppressed because think about it. If insulin's job, <clears throat> I always think of it as like a little suction cup that kind of like pops out of the cell. Right. And if you think of glucose as kind of these like balls sort of floating around insulin will like, it'll catch onto an insulin suction cup and just pull it into the cell. It's very scientific. So, um, <laughs> It's my visual. I love it. Uh, so, I love visuals. I'm a visual learner. Keep oh going. My gosh, me too. <laughs> you, are, you are speaking my language. So yeah, if you think about it that way, then when you're training, your body doesn't want to be sucking up carb and putting it into the cell. It wants to be using it and burning it. So you are correct in saying that what you're taking in during your training is being basically, it's like, it's think about driving a car, another analogy, right? You're, you put the gas in and you're burning it as you're going, right? The more you're driving, you got to go fill up the car or plug it in, as I'm saying now, since we're, you know, <laughs> especially in Massachusetts, we, lo we love um, electric vehicles and hybrids. Uh, so, you know, that's how to think about that. But yeah, outside of your diet, I would still like, you don't need to compensate. Like when we're thinking about grams of carbohydrates that people need as endurance athletes in a day, I'm also thinking about kind of like what you're getting in on mm -hmm. your ride. But I do think that focusing on those high quality carbohydrates outside of your training to give you all those nutrients, to give you the fiber to, right? Like to think about, um, for some reason, like a sweet potato keeps popping in my, or a potato yeah. it could be a sweet potato. Like that's a myth too. Like, um, but you're getting potassium in there. You're getting fiber, you're getting right carbohydrate too. But like, it's giving you so many of these, you know, broader range of, of nutrients. So I do think that during carb loading is probably one of the times though, I do recommend some of those simple sugars that can come in, mm -hmm. in the diet, but that's usually a carb load for, you know, races typically three days, um, not the old school whole week. Um, but sometimes utilizing a little bit more simple sugar, um, to help hit those higher ranges on a carb load, that's where I might focus yeah. a little bit more on, on simple sugars, but yeah, eat, I mean, eating high quality foods throughout the day. I mean, that's, what's better for our overall health. That's what's helped good for your gut microbiome. Right. So, and I, let's be honest, right. We've all been on those really long rides. Like you're kind of like, you don't want anything sweet afterwards. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. I'm like salt, salt, yeah. salt. It's like, yeah. The last thing you want to look at after a, especially like a long ride or a race is like, something sweet. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm no, like, no, you're right. That's why in an Ironman run, like uh, when you're at the end of that race, that long day, it's just like, where's yep. the chicken broth? <laughs> where's yep. the pretzels? Like yep. you just can't, it's like, oh my gosh. So, um, if somebody, cause I hear this, I've actually heard this from a couple of my own athletes where yep. they're like, well, I'm taking all these gels, but, or why am I not losing weight? Is it because I'm taking the gels in while I'm training? And I'm like, no, no. you are burning, no. right? through that, no. that <laughs> is your right. gasoline, right? Does your car drive without, you know, gas in or, or electric yes. charge again? No, um, that is not why someone's not losing weight. It's typically looking at the overall balance of the diet. And again, remember if someone is, I mean, overeating or under eating, 
just to make it really confusing. Yeah. Both of those things can, can cause you to gain weight, right. Or shift that, have mm-hmm. that negative shift in, you know, that, that body composition, um, timing is huge, right? Like how is someone spreading out their nutrition throughout the day, right? Are they under eating earlier in the day and then eating all their food later in the day, right? So even if you're eating like the right amount of calories, quote, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people try to sort of save up in the morning and that's not optimizing your metabolism. Your metabolism likes to eat nice and regularly throughout the day. Um, You know, I would say to people too, I always have people look at, you know, what about where, what sort of role does alcohol play in your diet? Like how much, you know, or how much are you sort of justifying? Well, I just had a five hour ride. So I'm going to just like, you know, again, I'm all about balance. You know me, I'm, I'm, that's like mm-hmm. my philosophy. And believe me, I love, I love a beer, wine or a cocktail as much as the next girl. But like, you know, I also think about like other things that people often don't, don't think about in their diet too. Um, but I do think the compensation idea of like, oh, well, I just did this huge X, Y, or Z. I can kind of eat whatever I want. Like, I'm not saying that's what your athletes are doing, but I do find a lot of times there is under eating that happens. People don't realize the amount of calories that they actually do need with higher volume training. Sometimes even they're like underestimating the lower volume training. Right. Um, Or again, just like not getting the right balance in throughout the day eating regularly right it's that's that keeps your metabolism working right Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of that so we kind of it kind of goes along the same lines we do have a question about fasted workouts um and is and this is actually in terms of weight loss which i know so she asked this question in terms of weight loss like will eating before a moderate morning workout versus a fasted workout actually help lose weight. So in terms of, and it's interesting because you talked about, uh, I actually have fallen into not fasted training, but not eating enough up until noon. And then realizing after dinner, I'm so hungry, even after dinner. And I'm thinking, you know, if you're working out fasted and, and waiting to eat, that's two different things, but talk to us about fasted training versus non-fasted training. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. It depends. I wouldn't say that, yes, it's going to make you lose weight or no, it's not going to make you lose weight. Right. Again, you're probably learning that like nothing is like one straight answer. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that's okay. That would be the art of my job. This is the art and the science, right? That's what you (laughs) that you can quote me on that. Uh, So (laughs) we make that a t-shirt, but no. So the thing is like, if someone is eating regularly throughout the day, if they're getting what they needed, if you're getting up first thing in the morning, you're going out for a nice aerobic run, you're staying under an hour. And again, you're well fueled. That's the key thing, right? Mm -hmm. You don't always need to fuel for that, right? Um, Some people wake up hungry and then I would eat before it. But if it's again, that it all depends, like what is the intensity and what is the duration? If you're going out for your long run and you're like, I'm going to go out fasted for this, it's going to help me lose weight. It's going to backfire. First of all, you're going to feel crappy during that run um, and you're going to likely end up overeating later in the day, right? So again, your body is going to be using what you, you know, typically what you're having before it what are you having before it though, right? Like if you're eating something 10 minutes before you go out the door, you don't want to eat a bagel and go for a run, Mm -hmm. right? Like 15 minutes before I should say, like that would be something like grab a banana, you know, grab a a gel. Here we go again. Um, A handful (laughs) of cereal, simple carb. But again, if it's that workout, I mean, I myself have done that. Like if I know I'm going Mm -hmm. for just a few short miles in the morning and I mean, I know I had a good dinner the night before, right? Sometimes usually have something after dinner. That's kind of just my way I eat. And uh, yeah, I would get up and and just go out there. If I knew I was doing like a, um, this is what I recommend for my, for my athletes too. If I was doing a something where I'm hitting the zone three, zone four, I'm going to do hill repeats. I'm doing mm-hmm. a track workout. That I'm not going into it without having a little something. Usually it's just a gel or like the um, gut, like the honey stinger gummies. Like I love a handful of those. Um, or if I'm at the track, I might even bring a bottle that has some electrolyte and carb in it. Just if I, you know, so I leave it on the track, you know, that's, that's easy enough. Um, I don't like running with bottles. So that's a, yeah, <laughs> I like can't, it's like, it's, I, yeah. Um, it's a sensory thing. I don't know. Um, but, so I think that you have to step back and take a look 
of that, like what's going on in the overall day? What is the workout? Again, mm. no issue. If it's less than an hour, easy run or ride or swim, and you've been well-fueled, you had a nice dinner the night before, um, yeah, you don't need to take anything in. If you're going to be hitting those higher heart rate zones, I would still recommend like taking in a little, again, even 20 to 30 grams of carbs, which could be a banana, could be some cereal. Again, easy, easy, easy. Or ha- I used to grab mm-hmm. half a half a cliff bar in the morning too. Sometimes yeah. I do that. Like, or the kids ones, just something like a little made good bar and I'd steal from my toddler. Yeah. And, uh, yes. um, but stuff like that, that's just simple, simple, easy, easy. Uh, so that's kind of what I would use as the rule of thumb. Like you don't necessarily like need to make sure if you're, again, if you're all your diet is adequate. If I have someone I'm working with that's recovering from like reds or something like that, a lot of times I'm still making them have a little something because we're trying to heal that metabolism and make sure the body is trusting them. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times I will still use a little bit of carbohydrate before a workout while we're going through kind of like a reds recovery. So energy, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So if I'm correct, you're saying that, and on the whole, it like treat if if you do tend to do that, if you want to do that kind of little easy, moderate workout under an hour fasted or not, like you'll still be able to get through the workout, but in terms of losing weight, like that's not going to make a difference. No, Um, no, And I think, yeah. Yeah. If you're taking in too much, right. Again, it's, it's, it is a bit about intake and output, right. But it is timing Mm -hmm. does play a role too. Again, if someone is working, you brought up a good point, Amy. That's what made me think of it, actually, that that reminder that like sometimes people don't eat before a morning workout. They go for their workout. They come home. They shower. They're like, yeah, I'll eat when I get to the office. Sometimes now we're, right. I mean, we're looking at maybe a few hours and now you might eat your breakfast and then you're like, oh, I'm still hungry. And you're going to get some, I'm still hungry. You're sort of like climbing out of a hole then, right? Um, so that's, I think, the things you need to be you need to be careful of. If you're trying not to have something early, but then you're compensating because you're hungrier throughout the day, you're likely taking in more calories later than you would have taken in. It's the same thing with post-workout things. I tell people, yeah, if you're not coming home and having your breakfast, I would recommend having like a recovery drink, a smoothie, um, chocolate milk even, if you're not going to have breakfast for another hour or two, because it's going to take that edge off and prevent you from feeling like you're overeating at that next meal, which is going to be more calories than just drinking 150 calorie chocolate milk. And is that the, um, what is, I forget, remind me again of like after a workout, is that the four to, is that four? Yeah. Three or four is again being sort of debated if it's three to one or four to one carb exactly to protein. So people like to flip that. Uh, but again, this is more of like an, you know, an aerobic workout. Um, typically it's 10 to 20 grams of carbohydrate, uh, excuse me, protein. Ooh, see, I just did it myself. No, everyone, <laughs> 20 grams of protein. And then like 30 to 40 grams of 30, 40, 50 grams of carbohydrate. So that's why okay. people are like, well, why chocolate milk? And I'm like, because the chocolate. So remember how we said the insulin is mm-hmm. responses suppressed during a workout. Well, after workout, it presents itself again. So now your body is looking for simple carbs, a little enzyme mm. called collagen synthase is going to go out looking for carbs to pull on into the cell to recover more rapidly, especially important if you have two workouts in a day. Right. Right. Um, and then, so, um, if you are, this is actually a question I have, if you are waking up hungry, yeah, does that actually mean that you're not fueling enough the day before if you wake up hungry or is that not no. like, what are signs? Yeah. What are, then what are some signs? If somebody doesn't, someone's like, I don't want to mess with my fitness pal. Like, yeah. I think I eat. Okay. Yeah. What yeah, are yeah. some signs that like you, you're not, really doing a good job with your nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. I mean, so one of the, I wouldn't necessarily say waking up in the morning hungry. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people are just metabolically very active. I mean, that's what we're looking for, right? So now if you're waking up hungry, because you ever notice sometimes you wake up hungry in the morning after a big meal. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Like after Thanksgiving, you're like, what the heck? Um, (laughs) Your metabolism gets a boost. That's my theory on it. So I'm going to have to do a study on that at some point. But um, 
No, I mean, I think that what I say can be a sign is the middle of the night wake up. Um, mm. I have a lot of athletes come to me and they're like, I'm waking up in the middle of the night, I'm starving. And I'm like going to the kitchen and eating. Like, is that okay? And I'm like, in the moment, okay, fine. Like, I want you to get a good night's sleep. But no, if this is happening every night, you're waking up in the middle of the night, something's falling short, right? We want to look at the day. We want to see, you know, are you getting enough? Um you know, and it could be increasing throughout the day. It could be adding a nighttime something like before they go to bed. Um, protein. I love protein before bed, like a yogurt okay. or um, something like that to give you that. Because protein is like, oh, you know, it's got that staying power. So, or like fruit and peanut butter or something like that that's going to kind of like hold you. Um, I think low, like low energy in, in general. Um can definitely be, I mean, there could be so many components to that, but if you're feeling really fatigued, right, you're feeling like you can't get through your workouts, um, that could certainly be something, uh, you know, if you feel like you're hitting the wall, um, we all have a bad workout here and there. We all have a tired day, right? That's not, it's things that you're noticing kind of coming up re- repeatedly. Also the bigger ones that we've if spoken extensively about for females, right? Any changes, I, I know this can be hard to, to see like how changes in menstrual cycle if you're on an IUD or if you're on a pill or if you're peri or postmenopausal, obviously. Um, but if you are someone who's menstruating regularly and um, all of a sudden you're skipping or your cycle gets very light. Um, so all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm getting it for two days, right? Um, that's, that could be a sign of underfueling. And for males too, not to neglect our male listeners, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you can see, I mean, we can see erectile dysfunction. You can see um, low sex drive. Um, so, I mean, l- lower libido can can be something in, in females as well. So that's definitely can be a marker because um, hormonal suppression, right? That's another way of yeah. telling. Um, I think also things like um, not ever feeling hungry can be a sign that you're actually, oh. well, it can actually go either way, right? If you're overeating, you might not feel hungry or if you're under eating. But if you're like objectively, I know I'm not, I know I'm not overeating, right? I'm having Mm -hmm. like, this is my lunch. I'm eating, you know, um, you know, you're not overeating and you're never feeling hungry. That can be a sign of that suppressed metabolic rate. Um, and, and constipation is actually something that can also accompany that you're slowing of your digestive system, which is Mm. always interesting too. Um, again, all of these things, like because now I'm sort of talking about red symptoms, right? Did you, did you notice mm. it kind of started to slide yeah. into like low energy availability? So there's all these like, you know, in the in the actual like publication in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, the REDS paper, for a clinician, it goes through like differential diagnoses if someone has constipation. Okay, well, have we also ruled out, you know, celiac, IBS, like, you know, or is this a, a result of, of, you know, underfueling, right? There's so many, that's why I always say it's a bit of a puzzle. I feel like I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm always putting pieces together and I'm a bit of a detective to kind of figure out, is this for, I mean, is this from reds? Is this from something else? Or does someone have reds and celiac or reds and IBS or, you know, PCOS leading to, you know, irregular menstrual cycles. So someone can have reds and PCOS, right? Like, or, be perimenopausal, but like, so there's all these different components to it. Um, but I think for our listeners, take a, take a look at it, like a long, hard look at your day and you don't have to calculate the calories to think like, am I eating breakfast? Am I eating lunch? Am I eating dinner? Right? Like it's how many times am I eating and am I having snacks? Right? Like it, depending on the volume of training, but even if you're not training high volume, like I would say at least one snack a day should be in there. Like, between your lunch and your dinner, I feel like that's a popular time for one. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, are my meals missing components, right? So, or, you know, have an expert sit down with you. But those are just some, hopefully that's helpful to kind of hear some, but the middle of the night wake up is a big one. I hear that a lot. Okay. All right. I never wake up in the middle of the night hungry. I'll tell you that. (laughs) Maybe that's a good sign. I'm asleep. No one has for now. It it definitely (laughs) happens. Or you have people listening that are like totally, totally there with you, Laura. Yes. So because then think about they it, need too. to eat. They need. To, and that's what I tell them. Like, yes, eat in that moment, but let's work on it so that we're not making a habit of this. Right. Like, cause no, I don't want you like disrupting your sleep like that, getting up in the middle of the night. Like you shouldn't need to get up in the middle of the night and eat. Right. Right. That's true. So, so now I want to talk to you though, quickly about 
Uh, social media buzzwords. Um, I've got a multi-part question here. Uh, the first one is I want you to tell us a little bit about how we sift through what is like legit and what is not on social media, whether that's Instagram or TikTok. And of course, you know, the 21 year old who's just lifting weights and being like, I only drink this during the day. And this is like, we know that's BS, but there are a lot of people out there who look like experts and talk like experts or people who are like, I lost a hundred pounds this way, or this is what I eat in a day who look like experts. How do we sift through the bullshit? (laughs) So there's a lot of it. There is a lot of it. Let me tell you. So I would be weary of people making all or nothing claims. Um, people that, you know, say like, kind of like these, you know, do this, don't do that. Eat this, Mm -hmm. not that. Like, I think you have to be a little wary of those things. Um, and I do think there is, there's a, there's a lot of that out there. Um, if you can identify is someone actually, you know, like for, I'll speak from the nutrition perspective, is someone a registered dietitian, right? Or are they just someone out there? Anybody, anybody can call themselves a nutrition expert on TikTok, right? Anybody. But does someone have like, if it's someone you're following, you know, are they actually like a registered dietitian or are they, you know, even with physicians, I, so I have a lot of physician friends, my best friend's a physician, right? Like, but I feel like sometimes I'm like, Oh God, why are they giving nutrition? And no offense if I have physicians yeah. anymore, like, but, um, a lot of physicians will tie many physicians that are patients of mine and, and clients that I've worked with, um, you know, in Boston, it's kind of unavoidable. Right. Um, uh, but, yeah. uh, so I, you know, and they'll say to me like, yeah, we don't get much nutrition in medical school. Like, yeah. that's, we get a class and I'm like, exactly. Right. So, and again, there are definitely some physicians out there that, you know, there's certain things that, that are okay. I feel like to recommend, but like, so that's why I am wary of like, even I've seen MD accounts that I'm like, Oh, not what I would recommend. Right. So I think that people that are also like promoting, products really hard to like, I tend to think if anyone's taking a really hard line or really strong stance, I would be wary of it. Um, well, I, I guess you got to be careful on that. Cause like I take a strong stance. on. <laughs> Trust me. It's okay. to call it. um, <laughs> But I really think if you can kind of do your research a little bit, if you're going to follow someone, do they actually, you know, is this someone who has a reputable practice behind them? Um, it's, it's hard though. I will tell you, cause you are targeted, right? If you look, look at mm-hmm. one of these you then get a million of them suggested to you. Um, I've done like research for like my patients and looked something up on, you know, the internet. And then all of a sudden I'm getting targeted on my Instagram. I don't do TikTok, but like my Instagram or what that like. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, no, like this is not, I'm not following this, but like I'm getting, you know, targeted by it. So Mm -hmm. I think you just have to always, I'm always, I lead with being a skeptic too, which I think is a helpful mindset to have with this. Like usually if it, here you go. Here's your big takeaway statement. If it sounds <laughs> too good to be true, it usually is. That's so true. Said, I lost a hundred pounds by doing this. Like, mm-hmm. okay. Well, always ask the question, well, what were they doing before that? Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's not just, there's always more to the story, um, but it's tricky. Like I wish I had like a, like a bullshit scanner. Um, yeah. Your social media. Can I invent that? Um, I know. Well, I it gets, you know, that. it gets into your psyche, you know, you see it 10 times and then you start I to think that. about it. Um, mm-hmm. in fact, so, and my second part is because I have heard my own athletes talk about this. Um, yeah. and the, this, these two words are coming up on my feeds on Instagram and stuff. There are two things. One is anti-inflammatory diet. Yeah. Um, about because whether no matter where we are, like where our body produces inflammation, we inflammation right. can lead to all sorts of things, you know, diseases, cancers. Yeah. So yeah. can you talk about the anti-inflammatory yeah. diet and then maybe the same thing, because sometimes it goes hand in hand, talk about a clean diet. Um, sure. and I don't know if those go hand in hand, but can you talk about that? So in my mind, they do not. And it might just be a verbiage okay. thing, right? So I think that's yeah, what we talk about, right? So when I think anti-inflammatory, the first thing that my brain goes to is the Mediterranean diet, 
okay, which is mm. that is the OG anti-inflammatory diet. And yes, if I could move to Greece and live on the beach and eat fresh fish and like sign me up, like I'm sure not one person on this call that uh, would not come with me, but yes. Yeah, so the Mediterranean diet, right? Healthiest diet in the world. Study after study after study still proves that foods that are high in those omega-3s, right? Fit, I mean, fish is like the best, right? Um, of course, see Cape Cod. There you go. We got Cape all that. Cape Cod. Good stuff. You can get fish. We have a lot of fish. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so fish. Um, lean, you know, lean, lean proteins. Like a, you know, there's not a lot of. There's some red meat in the you know Mediterranean diet, but it's lower in red meat. It's high in seafood. Um, it's high in animal pro or sorry, vegetarian proteins such as beans, um, and other legumes like lentils and, and grains. Um, so those are all, you know, they're pretty minimally processed foods, right? Um, the olive olive oil, right? He healthy, one of the healthiest fats in the world. And those those, you know, mono and polyunsaturated fats that you're finding in nut and seed oils too. So yes, an abundance of fruits and vegetables. That is the, like, I think that is like the gold standard way of eating, right? So where I think it shifts a little bit, I, so I think an anti-inflammatory diet is, I mean, that's just a, it's a really great way to eat, right? That being said, like, I think, again, you don't want to take it to the extreme, right? Because I think when I hear clean eating, that to me, I don't like that word. I feel like it, it, it just conjures up this like really like orthorexic, right? Which is being really rigid and um, mm -hmm. fanatical about the health of food um, versus allowing someone to have some flexibility. Yes, it's good to eat all these like really like make most of your diet from these really like wonderful whole foods, right? But that doesn't mean you, you know, if you have, you can't ever eat, you know, um, a French fry or something that comes out of a box or a package, right? Like we are busy people. I eat things out of boxes and packages. Like I eat more mac and cheese than I'd like to admit off of my children's <laughs> plates right now. Like, yes, it's a time of life thing. And I know I got shout out to Annie's mac and cheese out there. I know I'm not alone. <laughs> You know, so I do think that the more it's again thinking about how much you're doing these things. I think clean eating though can really um, create that like guilt spiral, right? Like, and when you mm -hmm. look at the social media and like these like beautiful plates of food that are like this perfect eating, I mean, that's not reality. Yeah, if we can have on our plates a, like a nice lean protein, a nice like a lot of color, that is what we always want. But that's not always going to be every single meal of the day, right? It's not for me and I do this for a living, right? But yes, the, the bottom line is the more high saturated fat, like high red meat, high processed food items. Yes, there's more sugar, there's more salt, there's more, of course, right? But so again, here I come back to this idea of like, where is the balance there, right? Some people talk about like 80, 20, um, which again, don't get rigid about it. I don't need you to calculate yeah. your calories. But yeah, believe me, that's happened to people are like, well, this was 80%. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yes. Most of the time, yeah, eat some amazing local produce. We, I get a CSA to my house. We get these big boxes of organic vegetables. It doesn't have to be organic. That could be another question. But our CSA happens to be um, from a wet farm in Western Mass, right? Like shout out Red Fire Farm. It's amazing. We get eggs from there. And like we're teaching our kids to, I mean, you know, eat color, eat fruits and vegetables, right? We're starting them from, even if they're not yet, don't freak out parents out there. Um, my kids still eat a lot of fish sticks, mac and cheese and French fries, but um, like food modeling, right? For them too. But mm -hmm. the more whole foods you can eat, yeah, of course that's going to be better for, for the body, right? But don't mm -hmm. get so caught up in it that you're like, I can't eat a granola bar out of bag, out of a package because it's going to inflame my joints, right? Like, no, <laughs> there you go myth busted. Um, <laughs> sorry, I really got on that. Really got on my, uh, what the heck? I can't even think. You know what I'm saying. Okay. I really got up. No, on I do. I think because when we think about, you know, I'm coming off an injury and sometimes yeah. it still flares up and I'm mm. getting this inflammation in my body that's swelling. So I'm like, yep. I need to be on an anti-inflammatory diet. I need to, you know, eat certain things and take certain supplements and try to get the inflammation down Yep. But then there's this part of me that's like, is this really working? 
<laughs> you know, like how much of like diet does matter. And I actually eat very yes. well, but, yeah. but I'm no, like, how sure. extreme do I go here with this anti-inflammatory diet? No, and is it just, who, is it just who, is it just who we, <laughs> No, it's not though. I mean, so there actually is science behind it. And typically like when I have someone recovering from surgery or something, you know, like, like surgeries, injuries that have like major inflammation in the body, or I have people that have like ulcerative colitis. Um, I work with a professional athlete with ulcerative colitis and like, yeah, we're doing high doses of omega-3 fatty acid um, supplements because there is a higher degree of inflammation in the body. So the body, a lot of autoimmune diseases too. Like mm. if people have, again, like an ulcerative colitis, a, a Crohn's, um, there's so many out there, but I will focus on getting in some of those omega-3s. There is research showing um, those higher doses of them actually can decrease some inflammation. It's not going to like suck the inflammation out of a knee you had surgery on, but like it can de decrease some of that. Yes, there is actually, there is science behind that. So um, all right. Yes, we love science. Science for the win. Make so. sure I'm getting my omega threes. Yep, I will eat make that sure. salmon. It's not not, not oh, native yeah. to uh, Cape Cod, but get like that sea bass. No, <laughs> bass. that is true. I omega so threes. as we wrap up, as we wrap up, um, we started out. We have busted some myths, but what have we not touched on that? Like, if you if you are these endurance athletes, males and females are listening. Mm -hmm. What are either some myths or things like you want to make sure we know either is not true or things to remember, you know, cause we're now in race season. Um, yep. it is June. What are some things that you really want us to be focusing on or not focusing on? Oh, I got one that just popped in my head and we yeah. basically did another, I think we talked about this in maybe our first podcast together, but, um, I, I don't think getting hung up on race weight, um, is oh, yeah. helpful. Um, I, I like to say that when we talk about racing season, because I think a lot of people, yes, some of our bodies naturally settle into a bit of a lighter place when you're peaking. Right. Um, but I think that like getting stuck on, like, I need to cut five pounds or I need to like, first of all, I mean, maybe we do have some pros on the call. I err on that listening. I'm sure you may have some, um, but even then, like, it's really about, remember my tagline, Amy, that fueled is faster, right? So if you are pushing so hard to lose weight, to get lighter, yeah, maybe you're five pounds lighter, but if you're under fueled, you could start to feel those negative impacts of being under fueled, right? So focusing on quality and consistency of the diet, I think is one of the biggest things that you can do, right? The under fueling is what's going to kick you in the ass every time, right? That's what's mm -hmm. going to eventually, even if it doesn't get you this time, it will get you, right? So don't get hung up on a race weight. I would say that. I would say just a good practice um, for everybody listening is practice, to use that word again. Now is the time to really be dialing in your nutrition on your long rides, on your long runs. So you want, I always say there's so many unknowns that can happen on race day. You want your nutrition to be as dialed in as possible. So thinking about what, what's your plan, how are you going to execute that? Um, and, you know, getting in those carbohydrates, um, and, oh gosh, there's so many, we talked about the clean eating. We talked about the protein, um, Ugh, what else? I think I hit some of the bigger what ones. What about as well, it, you know, for it's June. So this, I mean, people could be listening yeah. to this whenever, but it's really, really hot out. So can you oh. end about with hydration and how that you might yep. not even know that that's affecting you, like being under yes. high, under dehydrated. Why did dehydrated I say under hydrated? Or over hydrated, right? So oh. figuring out, I mean, yeah, the amount of sodium you might, I mean, definitely look at it. It is June, right? We're talking in June and it's, uh, it's going to be in the nineties here this week. Um, so 97, um, terrifying. Not on, the cape. Yeah. <laughs> not on the cape. Not on the cape. Not on the cape. Um, <laughs> Yes, in Cambridge, it will be a bowl of soup. Um, so very hot soup. But yes, you want to be thinking, I mean, hydration can definitely make or break you um, as well. Under, hydra under hydrating or over hydrating. So it's all about the electrolytes too, right? So it's not just about, I mean, a good rule of thumb, um, you know, I always say your base baseline is half your body weight in like the ounces. So that's a baseline. You're going to need more than that if you're training though. Right. So I would think about like on, you know, you want to be thinking about, you could do a sweat rate test. Actually, if you do have access to a scale and you don't mind seeing the number weigh yourself, 
minimal to no clothing before a workout as well as after a workout. And you can actually plug in online. There's fluid um, hydration. Yeah. It's not going to tell you how much sodium you need, but it will tell you how much fluid you're losing. And it usually like the Gatorade Sports Science Institute has one right on their website. So something like that can help dial in the amount of ounces that um, that you need per hour when when you're when you're out there, right? Because it can vary widely between people. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it is it is like if you're going out for a ride or a run, you also want like your baseline. Um, you know, I think just keeping up with hydration throughout the day um, this time of year is really key. But you're likely going to need. I mean, definitely on your longer rides, you're going to want to be trying out different um, hydration products. And do you need a salt pill? Some people need, you know, a thousand milligrams of sodium or more an hour. Um, to keep that because so, salt holds water into the body. So it helps maintain that balance. Okay. And um, can we just use like throughout the day, can we use the pea color test? Yeah. I mean, it generally, unless you're taking a lot of supplements that can tint the color of the urine, but yes, you don't want to be pure clear. You want to be light yellow, right? Too much water okay. can um, dilute the sodium in your, it overwhelms the sodium, dilutes the sodium in your body. It can cause um, hyponatremia if you're drinking extreme amounts of water, which can be quite dangerous actually. Uh, so it is, but yes, you can use basically the pea color test. Um, usually for most females, it's around two liters a day. Males, like three liters a day of fluid is kind of a ballpark. Um, so you can sort of get to that, uh, get to that range. Um, and Amy, I'm going to have to jump because I have a 215 patient. That's right. So, well, yeah. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to end on the conversation of pea. <laughs> You're and right. um, thank you right. once again for coming on to this podcast. And um, I will put in the show notes where you can find Laura um, okay. and reach out to her, especially, you know, if you need help. Thank you. That sounds great. Thanks, Amy. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. And we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.